Uh, so we will begin our lecture number three in our four part series on solar exploration with our same professor, Dan Rain. Before we start, I do want to thank friends of the library for sponsoring this program and basically all our programs and all their hard work. And at the end of the month, we are having a book sale weekend, April 22nd and 24th. Um, it's going to be a usual book sale Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And the Beer Friends preview sale on Thursday night at six. Uh, but it'll be back to the regular normal sale like we usually have. So that's the look forward to everything coming out. Uh, that's it, Dan. Okay. Then we might as well begin. And as soon as we can, we'll begin the slides. Welcome, everybody. We are now in the late 19th century in our story of great moments of polar exploration. We're almost to the North Pole, but not quite. So it might be a good time to talk a bit about the North Pole, uh, which we're about to see in the next slide. Uh, at least uh, a map of the North Pole. Uh, there it is. Not surprisingly, that's what it looks like on the map. The North Pole is a pretty unique place. There's no time zones at the North Pole. Probably will be no surprise to any of you. But uh, one thing that you might not know is that the North Pole is pretty unique in that the uh, sun, there's only one sunrise every year. Uh, and that's in March, about the time of the equinox, or close to it. And there's only one sunset during the year. One sunrise and one sunset. Sunset happens in September. And uh, once that happens, it never uh, quite rises again until March. The other thing about the North Pole is that maybe last time, if you watched the presentation, you were making fun, uh, sometimes I follow the trap of doing, of the people who thought there was an open polar sea at the North Pole. That, of course, is not true. The North Pole is an ice cap. But maybe people back in the 19th century were not so far wrong because there will soon be an open polar sea here because of climate change. And sometime probably in the 2030s, you'll actually be able to do what they wanted to do, which is sail a ship all the way over the North Pole to the other side of the world. Uh, maybe the best of all Northwest passages, pretty good for navigation. That'll save a lot of money for people traveling between the oceans, especially in trade, but uh, not very good news for the Earth. It does sit on uh, uh, water, of course. The uh, ice cap of the North Pole is about six feet thick on average, maybe in some places a little thicker than that, some places a little thinner than that. And it sits on top of about 13,000 feet of ocean where whales, uh, other kinds of marine mammals uh, typically go back and forth. The uh, bad news for explorers about that, the fact that the North Pole is ice, is that because of the movement of the water underneath, the ice turns into crevasses and, and cliffs and fissures and ridges, which makes it pretty difficult to take a sledge over that ice. One reason it was not going to be easy finally to get to the North Pole, not as smooth going as a landmass would be, which of course is what Antarctica is. Remember from last week, uh, the story of those who tried to get there by sea, but uh, eventually, as we know from last week, that was demonstrated to be impossible, ex especially because of uh, the DeLong expedition off the Siberian coast that we talked about uh, last time. Uh, as of now, uh, it's still an ice cap, of course, and it's ice at the time we're going to talk about in the early 20th century and the late 19th century. Uh, humans did eventually make it to the North Pole, uh, but it's not going to be probably until next week when we actually cover that. Uh, today, though, we'll talk about the attempts to get there, at least close to get there, before the final successful efforts were made. And that story is actually a story of three people, two Americans, and one Norwegian. And we'll begin with the, one of the Americans in the next slide. And uh, maybe that's the most unlikely polar explorer of them all. So that's Dr. Frederick Cook, a genuine go-getter, if there ever was one. Uh, he was of very humble origins, and he thought that he might become a doctor, being a, a very bright, inquisitive sort of fellow. And because he was a go-getter and didn't have a whole lot of money, he raised money by making his own milk business, where he would get up at 1 a.m. in New York City, acquire the milk, deliver the milk, and he'd be on time at 10 a.m. for his first medical school classes. And that's how he worked his way through medical school and eventually became a doctor. He fell in love early on, married a woman named Libby, and the best day of his life was supposed to come on the day that he heard that he'd just become a doctor. He passed his licensing board uh, test, but the day he heard the news, was also the day that Libby died. Uh, she'd gotten sick in childbirth, the, the child uh, didn't live, and neither did Libby. So the best day of his life was also the worst day of his life. By the way, uh, all that happened at his apartment on a West 55th Street in Manhattan, 
And my wife is in New York right now, and she went to see the place where Cook and his wife had lived. And uh, that place is still there uh, in Hell's Kitchen. And the, the rent, anybody care to guess, for 1,100 square feet at that place? 2,500. Uh, $6,000 a month. Uh, <laughs> 11, uh, it's probably not, not the way it was in Cook's day. Well, Cook was devastated by the news, of course, that Libby had died. Libby had died in front of him uh, in the bed of their house. And he had to forget this somehow. He was now in his 30s. How to deal with such devastating grief? And he began to think that maybe the thing to do was get away. And what's the best way to get away, especially in the late 19th century, are certainly the Arctic. Uh, that's about as far away as you could get. And he began uh, to look around for ways to get to the Arctic. He had thrilled to the tales of previous Arctic exploration, especially by the American that we saw uh, last time, Alicia Kent Kane. And he wanted to follow in Kane's footsteps. And luckily for him, uh, there was somebody who was just about to depart for the Arctic uh, that he could join. And it's this man here on the next slide, uh, a name you'll probably all know, and that is Robert Edwin Peary. Peer. There he is in his naval uniform, who, as a young man, anybody know the state he was from? He's born in Pennsylvania, uh, spent a lot of time in Maine, though. Uh, that's really his home state. And when he was a young man just getting his start in life in Freiburg, Maine, Peary actually was making a living as a surveyor and a taxidermist. And if he needed a robin stuffed, he would do that for $1.50, a pretty good bargain. But he didn't want to spend the rest of his life doing that. So when he was in his 20s, he entered the Navy. I became a naval officer. And if you go to the next slide, oh, oh, if you, okay. one too many. Well, that's okay. Uh, he made a, quite a reputation for himself, hacking his way on a naval expedition through the jungles of Nicaragua, uh, which you see here. And the reason the Navy sent them to do that was they were exploring the idea of a canal for Nicaragua. It's the 1880s by now. That was on a lot of people's minds. Dutifully, Peary went down there, and he did find his way through some uh, pretty intractable forest to uh, pioneer what might be a fairly good route for a canal. Now, why wouldn't you go through Nicaragua for a canal? There's a lake right there. Look at that massive lake uh, just waiting for you if you wanted to dig a canal. Just go along this uh, Rio San Juan. Probably wouldn't be too hard to do. But of course, that's not where the canal was going to go. The canal would go eventually through Panama. If we go to the next slide. Uh, Peary made a name for himself, not just with the Navy, but also with the general public, because he wrote about these expeditions to Nicaragua in the early issues of National Geographic. Uh, that's number four, right? That's number one right there. Uh, he wrote for number four. Number one is pretty important for us. There was a big article about the topographic survey of Massachusetts in National Geographic number one. Uh, Peary wrote for number four. And he'd have a relationship with National Geographic that would last the rest of his life that would be very important for him. Well, why didn't we build a canal through Nicaragua? Which seemed to make all the sense in the world. Well, we go to the next slide. Here's the famous story. Uh, stop me if, if you've heard this one. Uh, maybe you don't, that would be awkward. Uh, but the, <laughs> the reason uh, that we don't have a canal through Nicaragua is the Panamanian lobby that wanted a canal through Panama was much stronger than the Nicaraguan lobby. In one way, the Panamanian lobby was able to persuade the Senate to look for the Panamanian option and not the Nicaragua option, was they sent a bunch of correspondence to members of the Senate. And the correspondence of this stamp from Nicaragua, just for senators to look at. And if you look at the Nicaraguan stamp that the senator saw, you can see over here, uh, Mount Montatombo, a belching, smoking volcano. And senators began to wonder, maybe that's not the best place for a canal. Maybe we'll be surrounded by lava someday if we build a canal through there. And that's one of the reasons the Senate decided not to build a canal or look for a canal through Nicaragua, but rather Panama. And it's totally misleading. Mount Montatombo is over 100 miles away from where the canal would go, but the lobby did the work, and so we have the Panama Canal. Now, if you go to the next slide, uh, one of the people that accompanied Peary down to Nicaragua was this man here, uh, Matthew Henson, who Peary had met in the 1880s in Washington, D.C., where Henson was working at a store, and Peary was there uh, preparing for his Nicaragua expedition. He wanted a new sun helmet. Henson was happy to sell him a sun helmet. They got to talking, and Henson was hired by Peary as his personal assistant, and the two of them would spend the next 30 years in close collaboration, as we'll see in polar exploration as well. Another person that Peary was going to take on this expedition to Greenland of his, the expedition that Cook was about to join, if you remember, was Mrs. Peary. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see here, uh, that's Josephine Peary, who would accompany her husband to Greenland 
in uh, 1891 on the expedition that Cook was now about to join. And she was actually an important member of that expedition. Josephine Peary was as good as, if not better, a shot in hunting than any male member of Peary's expedition to Greenland. She was actually a very good shot indeed. Uh, and she may well be the first European or American woman uh, to go to the Arctic. Uh, a lot of people give her that title, but we'll never actually know because there's lingering theories that some of the men on some of the men on Franklin's expedition may well have been women. That's what a couple of the autopsies seem to have revealed. Hmm. There's a couple schools of thought about that. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. We'll never actually know. That's one of the most enduring mysteries of the Franklin expedition. But as far as we know, Josephine uh, was, was the first European or American woman to go to the Arctic. And because of that, she's known as the queen of the Arctic. Uh, that's her title. I don't know who elected her that, but that is her title. <laughs> and I think it's kind of unfair because imagine the hundreds of thousands of Inuit women who went up there all along. None of them got to be queen of the Arctic. <laughs> uh, and that's what we call Josephine. Well, not only uh, did she go up there on this expedition and prove to be an, an invaluable member of the expedition, uh, but on a future expedition to the Arctic, along with her husband, uh, Peary, she actually gave birth. Now we can go to the next slide. Uh, and here's her daughter, Marie. Uh, that's the famous Snow Baby, uh, as she was called, Marie Peary, uh, born a few years later after this expedition. And I knew you'd move and off at that. I can, well, you should. Uh, you know, uh, so the year is 1891. Uh, so off Cook, Henson, uh, Peary, and Josephine, they all went up uh, to Greenland on the seal hunting ship Kite. And the idea was to explore as much of northern Greenland and maybe Ellesmere Island as they could. We go to the next slide. Uh, the uh, mystery at the time was whether Greenland was actually an island or not. The more land there was on the way to the North Pole, the better that would be, the easier it might be to get there. And one thing Peary wanted to find out was how far did Greenland actually go up? Uh, and so this is uh, the uh, strait that we've seen before between Ellesmere Island on the left and Greenland on the right. And they're gonna go as much as they can up that strait and see how far north Greenland actually went. At least that's the idea. So on this sealing ship, the kite, the expedition began uh, proceeding north. Up the coast they went uh, past Ubernarvik in Greenland, which is to the south of that map. And they eventually got into uh, Melville Bay. Uh, this is Melville Bay. And that's where disaster happened because the skipper of the kite, the sealing vessel they were all on, was trying to get through some ice, a bit of an ice pack around there. And to do that, he had to back the ship up all of a sudden to go forward again. And Peary was standing on the stern, didn't know that the ship was going to back up that abruptly. And when the ship backed up abruptly, the helmsman lost control of the wheel, wheels going round, around, around, around like that. And the result of that chaotic motion was that the iron tiller right by the wheel came loose and it went straight like that careened into Peary's leg, uh, fracturing his femur and fracturing his tibia as well. He went down in great pain, obviously, but luckily he had with him the ship's expedition doctor, and that was Faber Cook, who masterfully set the leg uh, and allowed Peary to decide what probably I never would have decided at this point, which is to go through with the expedition and keep going. He was indomitable. He would not give up. And if you look at if you look at this slide for a second, they got out of Millville Bay. Uh, they went so further this way. They almost got to the Cane Basin when they decided to make camp around here in this part of Greenland. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see what their, their camp looked like. It became known as Red Cliff Camp. And that's why they were determined to spend uh, a winter, maybe more than one winter, uh, Josephine, her husband, Cook, Henson, and the rest of them. Once they were settled there, Peary, despite his injury, decided to take one other person, a Norwegian named Irvin Astrup, up through the north part of Greenland to actually see if it was an island or not. So it's only going to be two people with the, the sledges and the dogs on this expedition. So off they went, uh, 500 miles away from Red Cliff, their base camp, through the ice, <laughs> through the snow, on the dog pole sledge encountering here and there deep fissures in the ice in which on occasion the sledge would go over and they'd have to laboriously pull it back and save the dogs and save the provisions. And Peary was doing all this, remember, with a bad leg that Cook had set very well, but that certainly wasn't anything like 100%. So through the snow they went, and if you go to the next slide, 
they finally got to a point uh, in northern Greenland when uh, Peary and his comrade Asper climbed up this ridge and he could see in the distance what looked like ocean water. It's the, the summer by now. And he figured that has to mean that Greenland is an island, uh, that in fact it does stop. And it may be that he hadn't really seen what he thought he had seen. There's a lot of speculation that maybe this was the snow plane tricks on him. Maybe it was an Arctic mirage, which is very common. He might not have actually seen the end of Greenland. Uh, but we know that essentially he was right in his conclusion that Greenland is an island. Uh, it does stop at some point, giving way to uh, ice and water. And uh, that's why Peary is given the credit as being the person who finally decided that Greenland was an island. So he's 500 miles away from Red Cliff by now. Now they've got to go 500 miles back to Red Cliff, to the base. Off they went, more peril, more trouble, uh, more difficulty. And they finally got back to the cabin at Red Cliff, Josephine's cabin. She was still there. And my favorite part of the story is uh, Peary uh, finally gets to the door and he's trying to open the door to see Josephine. I hadn't seen Josephine in 85 days. 85 days, Josephine doesn't know if her husband is alive or dead. Uh, so Peary's trying to, in, in, the door won't open because it's barred. I don't think there was an actual lock, but I think it was barred in some way. And he's trying to get in. And it kind of reminds me of stories where you just lost your key, you can't get in at night. And he, he's away for 85 days and he can't get in. And Josephine can hear him trying to get in. And she figures must be an intruder. Like somebody trying to rob me, she's not going to open the door. And finally, he's yelling at her. And she opens the door and there's her husband. Uh, and they reunited after 85 uh, days. <laughs> I know. Go to the next slide. Uh, as for Frederick Cook, there he is again. He loved the Arctic. He spent as much time as any adventurer ever had in the Arctic while they were there in Greenland, trying to get to know the Inuit, uh, learn as much as he could about Inuit traditions and customs. And along the way, he showed himself to be a bit of a practical genius. Uh, he could take almost any kind of material and put it together and make whatever had to be made. He just had a knack for that kind of thing. I think of him, to go to the next slide, as uh, the MacGyver of the Arctic. Uh, <laughs> that's Frederick Cook. Uh, he loved sleeping outside, looking at the stars, the cold didn't bother him that much. He was in many ways a more attractive personality than uh, Peary was. Peary was egotistical. Uh, remember from a couple presentations ago, uh, Peary was the man who had stolen the uh, meteorites from Cape York, not from the Inuit up there. That was something Cook would never have thought of doing. Uh, as everyone knew, and this is another good thing about Cook, he was not just a doctor, but also a doctor willing to experiment. As everybody knew, to go to the next slide, if there was a problem with spending too much time in the Arctic, if you didn't have all the food you needed, the big danger was scurvy. And scurvy happens when, as you all know, we don't have enough vitamin C in our bodies. Uh, because unlike most animals, human beings cannot manufacture our own vitamin C. People can't do that. Guinea pigs can't do that. Most other animals can. They can synthesize their own vitamin C. We can't do that. We need a source of vitamin C in order to live. And the way we do it is we take in the vitamin C and a very special enzyme goes to work. And the enzyme, as you all know, is glutolactine oxide. Uh, this is ascorbic acid. Uh, glutolactane oxide takes the vitamin C, synthesizes it into ascorbic acid. And the ascorbic acid is what we really need. The ascorbic acid is but make sure that our connective tissue is maintained so that everything stays together in our body as it should. Collagen is a, it owes everything to ascorbic acid uh, as we do in general. And I'd like to thank my uh, in-laws in South Carolina uh, for information about ascorbic acid and all manner of things. It's very important that we celebrate this enzyme, uh, glutolactane oxide, because after all, today is the Luno Lactane Oxide Appreciation Day. Uh, so I, I hope you all join me. We so often fail to do this to show our appreciation for what keeps us alive. So if it wasn't for that connective tissue, for the collagen, of course, we'd all fall apart. And if you don't have the vitamin C, if that's not coming in, you can't make the ascorbic acid. And that means you get scurvy. And once you get scurvy, what happens is first, as Dr. Cook well knew, uh, white discoloration occurs on your gums. That means it's beginning. And then your tooth loosen, uh, your, your gums blacken, uh, you have terrible stomach pain, horrible joint pain, 
Uh, you die after a few months, and it's a horrible, horrible way to go. And many, many over the centuries have died of scurvy because of lack of vitamin C. Thousands died during the Crusades, uh, no vitamin C. Dozens of Franklin's men had died on King William Island because of scurvy. Uh, we know that much, at least. And astoundingly, two million sailors have died of scurvy, we believe, between 1450 and 1900. The era of the great ocean voyages was the heyday of scurvy, uh, killing two million sailors, more than all other causes of death combined on the high seas. What to do about it? Uh, nobody knew about vitamin C on Peary's expedition. They wouldn't know about vitamin C for an, another 40 years and, until 1930. But they did know, and they hadn't known ever since the uh, 18th century at least, that if you only had enough lemon juice or fresh vegetables and the sailors could eat that, if there was plenty of that, they wouldn't get scurvy. Uh, they couldn't explain why, but they could see the evidence in front of their eyes. And lemon was the best thing probably, uh, not limes. Limes don't work as well as lemon. Royal Navy was addicted to limes very misleadingly. Lemon worked a lot better. Well, Cook looked around him among the Inuit, and a puzzle struck him. Now, why would it be that the Inuits did not get scurvy? They almost never got scurvy, but they had no fruit, and they had almost no fresh vegetables. So how on earth were they surviving without scurvy? And he was smart enough to put two and two together. It had to do because they eat something that we customarily don't. And if you go to the next slide, what the Inuits were eating, here, here are the, some of the Inuits at least, uh, Cook was a very good photographer. Uh, I'm not sure if this is one of his pictures, but he took a lot of pictures of Greenland, uh, eventually elsewhere as well. And the riddle in front of him was why don't they get scurvy? And the next slide is the answer, according to Cook, it has to be because the Inuit were eating raw meat. Uh, raw reindeer meat, uh, raw seal, uh, raw fish of all sorts. They would sometimes cook this stuff, but they were also much more willing to eat it raw than Europeans and Americans were. And for Cook, that had to mean that's the answer. That's why they weren't getting scurvy. And we know that he's correct, that if you eat raw meat, there's a lot more vitamin C in raw meat than in cooked meat. Uh, if you cook it, uh, some of the vitamin C, a lot of it goes, but it stays in the raw meat. And the reason is that fish can synthesize their own vitamin C, and so can reindeer, and so can seal. So we eat their vitamin C when we eat their meat. Uh, Cook had solved the puzzle. And he went to Peary and he said, we're going to be here a while at Redcliffe. Maybe we should start eating raw meat like the Inuit do. So we'll, we'll be certain we're never going to get scurvy up here. Uh, but Peary vetoed that suggestion. For him, eating raw meat was a sign that you weren't civilized. So he was thinking rather abstractly, uh, raw meat, not civilized. I'll never do it. He said, I will leave the Arctic before I'll ever eat raw meat. Uh, luckily, they had enough provisions, so it didn't have to be a problem. But Cook was onto something uh, here, and Apiri, unfortunately, was wrong about this. This is a good way to survive in the Arctic. Well, the expedition to Greenland was very difficult, uh, but they were able to establish that Greenland was not an island, as you, what is an island, as you just saw. Uh, and once they decided to leave, uh, a lot of the members of that expedition never wanted to go back because it was so difficult up there. But that wasn't true of Cook and that wasn't true of Peary. Both of them really wanted to get back. They really had the exploration bug, the Arctic bug. The two of them had a temporary falling out because Cook went and published some of his findings without necessarily getting Peary's permission first, which Peary resented. But both of them at least have this in common. They loved it up there and they wanted to get back as soon as possible. So those are two captures in our story. We got Frederick Cook, we got Peary, those are the two Americans, and now it's time to meet the Norwegian element of our story. And that's the next guy here to appear as a very young kid. There he is, Ronald Amundsen, originally from the town of Borja uh, in Norway, who as a teenager had thrilled to the tales of Sir John Franklin in the search for the Northwest Passage in the 1840s. When he was 17 in Norway, his parents had taken him down to Oslo to welcome Nansen as Dawson came in from his famous expedition, the first expedition across Greenland, as we saw last time, remember they were on skis. And when Nansen came back to the harbor, uproariously, the crowds greeted him, cheered him to the rafters, and uh, Amundsen was there. And from that point on, he had the Arctic bug as well. He wanted to be an explorer, uh, even though by this point he was only 17. So he decided to train himself, he decided to get ready 
to be an explorer. And when he was in his 20s, what he decided to do, uh, along with his brother, if you go to the next slide, was to go out to this famous area in central southern Norway. That's the Hardangervida, Hardangervida, which is the broadest mountain plateau in Europe. And to give you some idea of how rough this place is, when they were making the movie Empire Strikes Back, this is where they filmed the series featuring the ice planet Hoth. Uh, up in the Hardangervida in Norway. Isolated place, windswept place, dangerous place. Uh, when the Norwegians in 1942 landed there to try to blow up the heavy water plant the Germans were using in Norway to try to prepare for a nuclear weapon, they had their home base here because they knew the Germans wouldn't go up there to try to find them. Uh, that's what kind of a forbidding place this was. And that's where Amundsen went. He wanted to train himself for three weeks, he wandered the hard Dargavita. Snow, blizzards, ice, horrible conditions. And one night, he decided, as the storm was raging, to dig himself a little hole in the snow, a little snow hole, so he could snugly try to get some sleep. And as he was in there, the weather was so terrible that he woke up encased in ice. He literally could not move in that little hole, covered in snow unable to do anything. And that would have been it for him, except his brother, luckily, was nearby, and his brother was looking for him. Where's my brother? And his brother saw a little boot, the tip of a boot protruding from the snow, and his brother said, that must be Roll. And so he spent an hour digging him out, frantically digging him out of there, uh, just in the nick of time, almost would have died of asphyxiation if it had been just a few minutes more, uh, but his life was saved. Uh, there in the hard dog of it. Uh, and if that were me, what I would have said was, Maybe I won't go to Greenland. <laughs> Maybe what I'll do is go to Florida study for windows. <laughs> but not Amundsen. He loved it. He loved this kind of thing. Uh, nothing pleased him more than a physical challenge like this, testing the envelope, if you will. And, and he decided to go on the next expedition he could find, uh, either to the Arctic or the Antarctic, to get some practical experience. So at the age of 25, luckily for him, or unluckily, uh, depending how you look at it, he signed on to one of the strangest of all polar expeditions, a Belgian expedition to the next slide, to Antarctica, led by a man named Adrian de Gerlache. And if you want to read about this strangest of all polar expeditions, this Belgian expedition, I highly recommend a book called The Madhouse at the End of the World by a guy named Julian Sankton. Uh, just came out, I think, last year. Really gripping account. That's the expedition. It's 1897. Uh, where Amundsen is going to go, only 25. Now, the idea was to sail into the Weddell Sea. This is what de Gerlache, the commander, wanted to do, which is on the right side of the map. Uh, learn as much as they could about the geography, and then go back probably to South America and maybe go back the next year. But de Gerlache, who really wanted to make a name for himself, without necessarily telling anybody first, decided that he would winter in the Antarctic to be the first expedition ever to winter in the Antarctic. That's the kind of thing I would want to know if I were on the vessel, uh, but it was all up in Nicolaj's head. He pretty much made the decision on his own. And so uh, later that season, the uh, Belgica, the ship, got itself marooned in the ice here of the Bellinghausen Sea. And there was no way out uh, as of the Antarctic uh, summer of, of 1897. They weren't necessarily well provisioned for this, but their galosh got them stuck in the ice anyway. And with no particular instructions from De Galosh, who really wasn't much of a leader, Amundsen had time to enjoy himself on the ice. And this is a typical Amundsen sentence. This is what he said. The cold has begun sharply. The ice is firm around us without ridges. This is starting to get interesting. He loved adventuring out on the ice, exploring as much as he could, which he did whenever was possible. And while he was there, surrounded by perpetual darkness, which set in without any hint of the sun in May, and did not come back again until uh, well later in the summer, uh, Amundsen, the adventurer, got to know a kindred spirit, none other than Dr. Frederick Cook, who was also on the expedition as the ship's doctor for the Belgica. The two of them, if you go to the next slide, were actually pretty different. Here's the Belgica encased in the ice in the Bellinghausen Sea. Uh, the two of them were actually very different in a way. Uh, Amundsen was taciturn, 
He didn't necessarily like crowds all that much. Cook, though, was gregarious, uh, friendly, cheerful. I guess in a way they were opposites, but here's a good example of opposites um, attracting and mutually benefiting from one another. If you look at the next slide, uh, here are the two men who more than anybody else saved the men of the Belgica from dying. Uh, some of them did die, especially from scurvy, uh, but many more would have died had it not been for them, who uh, kept the morale up and kept the expedition fed. Uh, that's Cook on the left, and that's Amundsen on the right uh, in Antarctica, on the ice surrounding the Belgica. The way Dr. Cook kept people alive was he had learned his lesson in the Arctic, and he knew the thing to do was find meat at all costs, uh, raw meat if need be. And that meant, of course, if it's Antarctica, penguins. And Cook argued to de Gerlache, we need to be feeding the men penguin meat, even if it's raw penguin meat. You've got to feed them this, this will save them. De Gerlache wanted nothing of it. He was hated the idea of eating penguin meat. And only when it became clear there was no option, as men began to sicken and die, did he allow feeding penguin meat to the men. And one of the great services that Cook and Amundsen did for the men of the Belgica was they went on expeditions whenever they could, rounding up penguin so they'd have something to feed to the men. And they did that so often that the two of them, along with one of the other friends on the Belgica, made themselves an honorary society ever afterward known as the Order of the Penguin from Antarctica. Uh, to Allenson's credit, he took to raw penguin right away. He liked it, nothing wrong with this. Uh, for others, it's an acquired taste. Well, it was on this voyage, the Belgica, 1897, 1898, that Cook noticed something else about the men, uh, even those who were not sick from scurvy yet. Nevertheless, they seemed lethargic. They seemed afflicted with not much will to do anything. A strange lassitude seemed to grip them. And he wondered why that would be. And he decided it must have something to do with the fact that nobody had seen the sun in weeks, months. He began to believe that people needed sun to thrive and to live. And he wondered, how can I treat these men who have no will to do anything? They seem to have lost all will to exert themselves and even live. So what he did was he made them, for an hour a day, go into the hold of the ship and stand in front of the fire. He said, take off all your clothes, stand in front of the fire for an hour. And that seemed to work. And a lot of people think the fire probably didn't do anything. It was probably just Cook's optimistic attitude, the heat of the flames, that might have helped lift their spirits. But Cook was on to something. And ever since then, if you've got seasonal affective disorder, one of the treatments is light therapy. Here's the beginning of light therapy, and we owe it to Dr. Cook. He really was quite something in his own way. It was Dr. Cook with this practical genius of his that not only saved the crew with penguin meat and maybe light therapy, who knows, uh, but also was able to finally achieve the design that would get the Belgica free of the ice at long last, uh, just in the nick of time, in March of the next year. Uh, he devised just the right pattern of an ice canal to cut through the ice, one mile canal, so that when the storms began to arise, to kind of push the Belgica out through that canal and luckily into the open water. Uh, he was also the man, as I said earlier, who made the very first photographs in the Antarctic, and he was also the man who devised a conical kind of tent, which would keep the wind out better than conventional tents. All of this he did as a member of the Belgica. Although, like everybody else, he was relieved to finally get going. Uh, just in the nick of time, as I said. They wouldn't get free of the ice. And de Gerlache would make his way back to Belgium, a hero because he was the first, or leader of the first, expedition ever to spend a season in the Antarctic. What Perry had done in the Arctic, P-A-R-R-Y, uh, Tegelash did in the Antarctic. So he went back to Brussels, uh, eventually ended up in Antwerp, and he tried to make a living giving tours of Arctic seas to the extent that he could. Kind of an original idea ahead of its time. So he bought this ship, and he would take people on excursion tours, but he couldn't really make money off it. Expenses were too big. So he finally decided to sell the ship. He was looking for a buyer. Who's going to buy the ship? And the guy who bought the ship was none other than Ernest Shackleton, who renamed the ship the Endurance, after his family motto, Fortitude Fortitude Luckily, it's not my motto. Fortitude in by Endurance we conquer. Uh, and that's the ship that would eventually go to the South Seas, recently found just a couple months ago 
uh, that you've probably heard of, and we'll be going into that ship uh, next year in 2023. So here we are finally in 1900. Uh, all three of these men were gripped by the dream of getting to the poles, especially the North Pole. Cook, Peary, Amundsen, they all had that in common. All wanted to achieve lasting renown by having that achievement next to their name for all time. They had constant trouble raising money for this. It was never easy to get the money together for these expeditions, but they were determined to do it. And the question was, which one of them would actually get there first? Now, of the three, Cook, Peary, and Amundsen, Cook may, in his own way, uh, have been the most flawed. And he was a really admirable guy in many ways. As I said before, cheerful, liked to be with people, kept people's spirits up, very, very much an innovative kind of genius. But he didn't quite have the moral compass that maybe the rest of us like to believe of these that we love. So if you go to the next slide, and here's an example of this. Uh, on the Belgica expedition, one of the places they stopped was southern Argentina and Terra del Fuego. And while stopping there, Cook got to know an English missionary, a guy named Bridges, who had spent 30 years compiling a dictionary for the language spoken by the uh, Yagan people who uh, had long inhabited that region. 30,000 words were in this dictionary. It was a monumental achievement. He would talk to people, get the English equivalent, write them down. We go to the next slide. Uh, here's a, what the dictionary looked like in Bridges' handwriting. Cook got to know Bridges, and at one point he said, I will take your manuscript to New York, and I'll get it published. So he took the manuscript, went to New York. In the meantime, Bridges died. And from that point on, Cook did try to get it published, but he misrepresented the extent of his own involvement. He kind of tried to pass it on, at least in part, as his own work, uh, which certainly was dishonest. And if the Bridges family had not intervened, he might have done that. We would have printed Cook's dictionary when actually it was Bridges' work and not Cook's. The family wanted this dictionary back, priceless and brilliant as it was, but Cook didn't give it back. Uh, and when Cook died, nobody could find it. Where is this priceless manuscript of the Yonkan language? And it didn't turn up until 1945 at the end of World War II in a German farmhouse, just coincidentally. And today, luckily, it resides in the British Museum. And if you want to see it, you can go online and there you can read it to your heart's content. But it has never to this day been published in printed form. Uh, it's just a manuscript at the British Museum. So there's a bit of shadiness, often people say, about Cook. But the best example of this is what happened a little bit later uh, after he had gone back from the Belgica. If you go to the next slide, uh, there's the famous story of Cook's attempt to conquer the novel, which, of course, back then was known as Mount McKinley. And here's Mount McKinley in all its majesty. Tallest peak in North America. Never been climbed, as far as anybody knew. And so in 1903, <coughs> funded by uh, a few sources, including members of the family of the expedition, Cook took an expedition to Alaska because he wanted to be the first to climb McKinley, as was then known. And he did become the first, this expedition, to walk around McKinley, circumnavigated the mountain. As far as we know, uh, no, no non-Indigenous person had ever done that. So he achieved that, but he couldn't get to the top. He only got 11,000 feet, just a little more than halfway. And the expedition members, faced by cliffs and precipices, decided we're never going to be able to do it. Maybe this mountain can't be climbed at all. And so they came down the mountain and went home. But Cook was not discouraged. He decided to go back, different expedition. They tried again, didn't get very far this time. And then once more, they began to go home, and that should have been it. But on the way home, towards the Alaskan coast, Cook and another man named Beryl, uh, Edward Beryl, decided they would actually go back to McKinley and have another try. So now it's just the two of them. Go to the next slide. And according to Cook's account, these two actually got to the top of Denali, Mount McKinley. So there you see on the left, the famous photograph that Beryl took, no, the, no that Cook took, of Beryl on top of Mount McKinley. This Beryl holding the American flag, 
cook presumably with a camera a little bit below. And because some of the money for this expedition came from Harper's Weekly, that picture on the left was published in a triumphant article in Harper's Weekly, Cook has indeed conquered Mount McKinley. Well, there's a bit of a problem with it though, as a Belmore Brown, who had been on the expedition, one of those who went to the coast and kind of gave up, decided that Cook probably didn't do it. And as soon as he could, Belmore Brown went back into the wilderness and he took the picture on the right. That's the same spot where Cook had taken the picture on the left. But the problem is that spot is not Mount McKinley. That spot is 20 miles away from Mount McKinley. So much smaller peak. And the weight of opinion is that Cook had not gotten to the top. He had faked that achievement by taking that picture, claiming it was Mount McKinley, when we know it really wasn't. And one thing that he did that was uh, pretty dishonest was when he had that picture printed in Harper's Weekly, he cropped off, you see the dotted line? He cropped off the picture so you couldn't, couldn't see this part there. And it's hard to see from your angle, but on the very right side of that picture is a view of Mount Grosvenor in Alaska. And you can't see Mount Grosvenor from that angle in Mount McKinley, which means it had to have been faked. Uh, that's why it could crop the picture. So you couldn't see Mount Grosvenor. Uh, but that's actually where it was. And uh, Belmore Brown, by uh, 1910, had demonstrated that Cook could not possibly have done this. But that was 1910. And in the meantime, Cook was celebrated as the conqueror of Mount McKinley, which would allow him maybe to raise the money he would need to raise to get to the North Pole, which is what he really wanted to do. So with that questionable achievement, if you want to call it that behind him, Cook made ready to get to the pole. And at the same time, Peary was putting his own expedition together to do the same thing. One way or another, it looked like the pole was about to be conquered. But before we get to that, we have to get back to the third member of our story, who also would have loved to have gotten to the pole, but had another idea in the first place. In the meantime, uh, that's Peary. Maybe we should talk about him first before we get to the other guy. Uh, I got I'm so excited about talking about Amundsen again that I forgot this part. So here's Peary. Uh, and I said he desperately wanted to get to the pole, but before he put together the expedition that would get him pretty close to it, he was still exploring as much as he could about Greenland and Ellesmere Island by way of preparation. And during these expeditions, he eventually lost every single toad to frostbite, except for the little pinky toes. That's all he had left. He and Matthew Henson, on these expeditions to Ellesmere in Greenland, they covered hundreds of miles of sledging, explored a lot of the territory, got pretty far north on some of them. But at one point, nobody had heard from Peary in a long time, over a year. And Josephine got to be worried about him, as did others. So they financed an expedition. The Arctic Club put up a lot of the money on Manhattan to go and try to find where Peary was. We're in the first decade of the 20th century by now. And all that expedition happened to be Frederick Cook. This is after the Belgica, but before he tried to go up Mount McKinley. So up through the familiar waters of the Cane Basin they went, and they found where Peary was. They tried to get him to come back. Cook looked at the frostbitten, absent toes, and he knew about the injury to Peary's leg from years before. And Cook said, you can't possibly walk on ice anymore. As a doctor, I'm advising you to come home. This isn't making any sense. But indomitable Peary decided, I'm not going to go home. And he tried to make one more attempt, this time, not just to explore, but maybe to get to the pole itself. So onto the sledge with a couple of companions, he went north of Ellesmere Island, trying to get onto the ice cap, maybe to get to the pole, through ridges and crevasses and fissures. They got to 84 degrees north on this attempt, this particular attempt, when finally, Vast amounts of rubble in front of them proved to be an obstacle they could not surmount. Heartbroken, Peary gave the order to turn back. In the meantime, Josephine had had another child, a daughter named Joe, who died uh, after a very short time uh, alive. Heart uh, devastating Josephine, of course, and Peary when he heard about it. And so because of the failure of this expedition, 
uh, Peary wrote in his diary, quote, I am now a maimed old man. He was only 46. I am now a maimed old man. I'm successful after the most arduous work. Away from wife, away from child. Mother dead, one baby dead. Has the game been worth the can? Well, he and Josephine had a nice property on Eagle Island in Casco Bay in Maine. Anybody else would have just retired there. Peary had a number of his achievements to his credit. But as I said before, if he thought that way, it wasn't for very long. Despite everything, he would make at least one more stab for the poll, uh, which we're about to see next week. But now it's time to conclude. And now we finally get to the third character in the story again, that's Amundsen. Now we'll go to the next slide. Here's uh, Amundsen, the way he looked uh, by the time he was in his 30s, uh, getting to be in his 40s. And the limelight in the first decade of the 20th century, as it turned out, would be shown on Amundsen because he had always wanted to be the first to get through the Northwest Passage. He had dreamed of that since reading about Franklin as a young man. And he finally decided the time had come to actually do it. He would approach this problem at Northwest Passage, the first person through, with the systematic dedication and learning and attention to detail that would characterize him throughout his career. And for him, the point was never to surround great hardships and survive where others might not. He didn't want to be a romantic hero achieving great successes against fabulous odds. He just wanted to get the job done. He, had a, he was a scientist as much as anything, just as his hero, Bridgeoff Nansen, was a scientist more than anything. And so he approached this task with quiet determination, research, and skill. And what he decided was, if you wanted to get through the Northwest Passage, be the first one to actually do it, uh, don't make the mistake of taking a large ship that would have trouble in the ice. If you go to the next slide, he decided, based on experience, to buy this ship. It's only 45 tons. It's a herring fishing vessel. And it's called the Yola. Uh, and that's the ship, very small, that he would take into the Arctic. And it was very shallow draft. So you could be made three feet of water and this thing would get you through. So the point was not to push against the ice. The point was to find the little narrow leads in the ice and navigate them and get through the passage if you needed to that way. It's only 70 feet long, this ship. And the other thing he decided was, if you're going to get through the Northwest Passage, don't have a big crew. Uh, that's just going to make your food problem even worse. Take the smallest crew you can, and that way the food will last longer. And also, nobody will ever be bored. A small crew will never run out of things to do. They'll always be busy because there's so few of them. And that's going to make things easier. That's going to be good for morale. And so with a small crew and a small ship defying all of the odds and all of the problems that afflicted earlier voyages, Amundsen set out in 1903 to try to get through the Northwest Passage at long last. Characteristically for him, he set up quietly without any fuss, partly because he was afraid his creditors would seize the vessel. Uh, he owed a lot of money. He borrowed money for this expedition with the help of Nansen. But he was able to get out into the Atlantic. And now we can go to the next slide and we'll see what he did. So here's the review portion of our presentation today so that we remember everything we've talked about the last uh, few weeks or so. Uh, through Batman Bay, he went, as usual. And then he turned through to Lancaster Sound, following in the footsteps of so many before him. Here's where, remember, John Ross had thought he'd seen those mountains and turned back where there weren't any mountains, something that he would never live down for the rest of his life. And through Lancaster Sound went Amundsen uh, into the Barrow Strait, and then they turned here, that's Peel Sound, turning left there, following in Franklin's footsteps, because on the way they passed Beachy Island, where the three members of Franklin's crew were found. The first three uh, who had died during the expedition, the crosses from those graves are there to this day. And Amundsen saw them and had a, a very solemn moment of silence, paying tribute to Franklin's lost men. So past Beachy Island, into Peel Sound, through what became known as the Franklin Strait here. And then he turned this way. Franklin had gone 
that way. Appleton turned this way, keeping King William Island to the right and uh, the Boothia Peninsula to the left, rounding King William Island like this. And at that point, very close by where the uh, Erebus and the Terror had met their fate on the other side of King William Island, Amundsen turned into the strait. He had gone through Ray Strait, named after the man, remember, who had solved the Franklin mystery by talking to the Inuit many years before. This is Ray Strait here. But he turned right through there. So about to get through the Simpson Strait here, and there's no ice. He can see right in front of him, there's no ice blocking the way. He could have made it through the Northwest Passage that season. But to his eternal credit, September of 1903, Amazon decided not to go through. And the reason was, this was partly a scientific expedition. And he had promised Nansen, his hero, that he would make scientific observations about the North Magnetic Pole. So he didn't go through when he could have. He turned around. And he decided to winter in a little bay right about there. You go to the next slide. Ever afterward, and known to this day as Yoa Haven, after his ship. And that's what Yoa Haven uh, looks like today. And there, for the next two years, he made very careful observations about the North Magnetic Pole. And it's that expedition that proved for all time that James Clark Ross had been right uh, 60 years before. That in fact, the North Magnetic Pole is not just one place, it moves around, and Amundsen had shown it for all time. So, for a long time, almost two years, they spent at Yoa Haven. And Amundsen spent that time learning everything he could about the Indian. His later success was largely due to the fact that, unlike Peary sometimes, Peary learned to, didn't appreciate the Inuit quite as much, though. Uh, Amundsen had a real open mind where the Inuit were concerned. And this is what he learned. First of all, uh, if you go to the next slide, he learned that Europeans and Americans who went to the Arctic were dressing all wrong. That when Europeans and Americans went there, they typically had long woolen underwear and a bunch of wool layers underneath their coat. And the bad thing about that was, if you move around a lot, which you've got to do in the Arctic, you're exerting yourself all the time in terrible privation. What happens is you sweat a lot, and if you sweat a lot, that means the moisture builds up. That means you're actually cold and not warm. Uh, tight woolen garments are terrible in the Arctic. Sweat is a terrible thing in the Arctic, but the Inuit didn't need to worry about that because they had these uh, terrible fur uh, coats that they would wear, and uh, they didn't have anything tight on their bodies. Everything was loose, the air would circulate. They could move around better, they could exert themselves better, and that was the way to live in the Arctic, as Amundsen soon found out. He adopted that idea, and he never forgot it for the rest of his career. He also learned from them that if you're going to pull a sledge in the Arctic, you should wet the runners so that ice settles on the runners. That way, you can go a lot better over ice than it would if you didn't wet the, the sledge first. He found that out. Uh, he found out, among other things, if you go to the next slide, that if you want to live anywhere in the Arctic, there's nothing better than that, the igloo. Uh, Amundsen spent a lot of time learning how to make an igloo. And he and the Norwegians, there were only six members of the crew, he and the Norwegians were never as good at making an igloo as the Inuit were, of course. It took them a lot longer to do it. But once they did it, they found that that kept them a lot warmer than anything made of wood or canvas ever would. One night, Amundsen was there, delighted, we would have to assume, when the temperature outside was 77 degrees below zero. And he's in the igloo, and he said, we were just as toasty and as warm as can be. And he never forgot that lesson either. So for two years, he learned. And eventually, it was time, as the summer began in 1905, to get going again at long last. And so into the Simpson Strait, he went. They got through it. They began navigating for the next two weeks the strait between Canada and Victoria Island, threading their way to do what nobody had ever done, to actually get through the passage. And then, to the next slide, on August 27, 1905, the great day came. The Yoa, proceeding from the west, from King William Island, encountered an American whaling vessel, which you see on the left. That's the Charles Hansen, coming from the east. 
coming from the Pacific. When they saw the Hansen, Amundsen was below deck. He was trying to get some sleep. But then he heard all this running around on the deck. So what's going on? And somebody ran down the steps, knocked on his door, and said, uh, Commander, Commander, vessel in sight. He had done it at last. What Frobisher and Hudson and Ross and Perry and Franklin had all failed to do, Amundsen had done. He had made his way through the Northwest Passage and he had encountered the Hansen coming from the other side. It's a great moment. Uh, the first great moment I think we've seen so far is James Clark Ross seeing that first sight of the Ross Ice Shelf in Antarctica. And this might be the second great moment, the achievement of the Northwest Passage at long last. The bad thing was he'd done it. He was overjoyed, he'd done it. But he couldn't tell anybody because by this time the ice was setting in again and everybody had to spend the winter off the coast of Alaska in the Beaufort Sea. It was the Yola, the Hansen, about 10 other whaling vessels that were all there together. But Amundsen really wanted everybody to know, but how's he gonna do it? There's no ship to ship wireless yet. Uh, so what he did was he got out on the ice. Remember, he's Norwegian, he's a disciple of Nansen. He got on the skis and he skied 500 miles cross country. He skied 500 miles to Eagle City, Alaska. And there he sent a cable to his hero, Nansen, because he wanted Nansen to be the first to know, I've done it. We've done the Northwest Passage. So he sends the cable, guess how much the cable cost? He had, he had to do a collect, he didn't have any money. Uh, so he had to send a collect, $700. This is $700 in 1905, uh, $700 for the cable. Uh, and the bad thing was that it didn't actually get through. There are all these problems. And the news leaked out. So Nansen wasn't the first to know that the newspapers actually knew it. And the entire world now knew it. So by 1906, when they got out of the Beaufort Sea, when they got out of the ice, uh, everybody at once went to Nome, Alaska. Finally, we're going to get to civilization again, uh, as they saw it. They get to Nome, Alaska, and uh, the Yoa went into the harbor, and everywhere there's Norwegian flags, and everybody's decked out to wonder to welcome them and know. And people were singing at the top of their lungs, uh, Norway's brand new national anthem, Yavi Eisberg Detta London. Yes, we cherish this country. Because as Amundsen found out when he encountered the Hansen uh, the year before, before they got set in the ice, Norway was now indeed an independent country. He didn't know that yet, but as of 1905, it was due to the efforts, as we saw two weeks ago, of his friend Nantes, or partly to his efforts. So this was an impressive achievement. Uh, getting to be more and more impressive as the years go on and as the ice diminishes up there so that in 2007, the entire Northwest Passage uh, was completely free of ice and many seasons have been like that uh, ever since. But uh, Amazon was the first one to get through. Now, if we go to the next slide, uh, this was indeed an achievement. And before I leave you, I did want to say that maybe as we celebrate Amundsen and uh, Cook and Peary for a the things that they did, we should not forget that although Josephine Peary claimed the title of Queen of the Arctic, I think if anybody is going to get the title these days, if it's not going to be an Inuit, maybe it should be her, uh, and that's Lynn Cox. And Lynn Cox is an American. She was the very first person to swim the Bering Strait between Russia and the United States. Wow. And she's a big admirer of Amundsen. So she wanted to trace the Northwest Passage. And at the key moments in the Northwest Passage, like King William Island uh, and off of Devon Island and off of Greenland, uh, she would actually get in the water up there. And she would swim around for a while. So she could swim the Northwest Passage. She didn't swim the whole thing, but she would get off now and then and swim. Uh, absolutely unbelievable achievement. The Arctic still captures popular imagination, in other words, to this day. But what we don't know is who's going to get to the North Pole first. And uh, that answer will be revealed next time. And it's going to be one of those three men. It's going to be Cook, it's going to be Peary, or it's going to be Amundsen. And it may be that the first to the pole is not the person that in high school, maybe you learn was the first to the pole. So uh, we'll talk about that next time. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I uh, dove into Amundsen before I was through with Peary. I feel bad about that. But if, if any of you have any questions or, or comments, uh, now would be a good time to bring them up. Before we adjourn uh, for a lovely Sunday afternoon, after I talk for a full hour or so.
And you, you know that it's always okay if you want to get up and walk around. So mm -hmm. I hope you didn't feel as good to stay where you were for an hour. Mm -hmm. But uh, anybody has any questions, go right ahead. It's okay if you don't. Uh, the answer to the question why the hydro to the Arctic is it's cold up there. <laughs> That's probably an easy one. Anybody else? We can just uh, adjourn for the day, if you like. And Thank you very much. And next week, we're finally going to get to the pole. Uh, <laughs> Thank the water, you, Dad. The water is probably the roughest of anywhere in the world. Right? Yes, that's, that, that's another thing. Very, very rough seas, both in the Arctic and the Antarctic. Uh, south of South America, just off the coast of South America, it's about as bad as it can be. Uh, that's usually how they were going to get there. But yeah, that, that's absolutely right. Uh, Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Next, everyone, next week. Thank you for coming. Yeah.